I think in the people who deal with childishness with gentleness and firmness but are love the word and teach the word like like those people have such a lasting influence on the next generation and i think it's it's having a culture of welcome where you can come in and be at home i'm rush witt and you're listening to straight to the heart a podcast from new growth press each episode includes interesting talks with leading authors and thinkers We hear who they are, what they think, and how they approach their important work in ministry, and the moments and influences that change their lives. Today, I enjoyed an encouraging conversation with Jared Kennedy, who is the co-founder of Gospel Centered Family and an editor with the Gospel Coalition. Jared has authored books for children and church leaders like Keeping Your Children's Ministry on Mission, The Beginner's Gospel Story Bible, and the forthcoming resource, Faith Builder Catechism. Jared is joyful, encouraging, and an all-around easy person to talk to. Jared talked to me about his family in Louisville, his important work with the Gospel Coalition, and what raising chickens in suburban Louisville taught him about parenting. I know, right? You're really going to enjoy hearing this episode of Straight to the Heart. Well, I am I am home in my bedroom today. Normally, I have an office over in a, a building with some nonprofits that I that I normally work out of. Um, but uh, we have a daughter sick from school today, so I'm I'm hanging here. I'm hanging here in the house. You know, I don't I don't uh, I don't know everyone super well. We don't know each other super well. So, in fact, I was I, I'm curious to to know more about the ministry you started gospel centered families, because I, I don't know very much about that and it would be cool to hear about it. Well, gospel centered family is, um, a ministry that I started, um, for a couple of reasons. One, um, I just, I wanted to have, I think I st- started a blog first and I wanted to have a place to write on a regular basis. And so, um, that blog, was gospel centered family before there was ever a ministry called gospel centered family. And so, and then I, I had opportunities to speak and um, consult and do coaching with churches um, primarily in what was Sojourn network at the time, what is now Harbor network, which is the, the network of churches that I'm a part of. Um, and so, you know, we needed a, uh, like a a good legal <laughs> like ministry way right. to keep track of that work that I was doing and um and I had this blog and so uh, a couple of our pastors at that time said hey why don't you take this name and and like make this a ministry and we'll coach you on how to how to make that happen um in order to kind of take care of these um. Yeah, side hustle in some sense. I don't know if you want to call it that in ministry, but like those those opportunities I had to to coach and and do that work. Um, and then yeah, in 2019, um, you know, I made a shift in ministry life from being a full time pastor in our local church, full time family pastor, right, to doing um, really full time editorial work, mm-hmm. freelance um, working for for various organizations. And so it was good to have the ministry incorporated and to be able to do some of that work through the ministry at that time. Um, but it grew a bit. And then um, over, over the course of a year or two, maybe not as much as we hoped because COVID happened, which we weren't expecting when the ministry didn't grow maybe as much as we had, we had hoped mm-hmm. in 2020. And then uh, the opportunity um, came along. I was writing a book at that time with um, the Gospel Coalition on children's ministry. And um, Ivan Mesa, who is now my boss, who is the editorial director for TGC, um, gave me a call and asked if I would I would come um, come on the team. And so currently, uh, Gospel Center Family is in this process of um, some things are just dormant because I I have a full time job and I don't do those things. Um, but my prayer is that, um, some of the other guys I'm writing with Trey Coleman, um, and Kevin Hippolyte, who serves at our church, like that over time, I would be able to hand some of those things over to them and allow them to serve those churches in our network area. That's, that's all a so, great work. So important and, and helpful. 
It's always a funny way to put this question. Uh, you know, sometimes people, when we put questions about how someone began doing something, we say, how did you get into, how did you get into family ministry? Again, that's like a weird way to say that. No one says, you know what I think I'll do? I'll try to get into family ministry. I'm curious, how did you come into or start family ministry, and it became such obviously a big part of what you have contributed and continue c- contributing to the health of local churches all over through various you know networks like the Gospel Coalition and your own ministry. So, how did all of that come about for you? Maybe coming out of seminary, your interests, your background. How, how did that all come about? Um, well, I was tricked into it. So. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Who tricked you? No, I <laughs> happily tricked um, into Rob it. Plummer. Thankfully, Rob, Rob Plummer, Doctor Rob Plummer, tricked me into it. But um, no, I I love kids, and I've always really I had a lot of like nephews and nieces and and um around when I was growing up, and I, I really love spending time with kids. And I, I think even when I was in high school and college, I volunteered with the children's choir at church and volunteered with with vacation Bible school. And so there were, there are, um, there's a children's minister I mentored a few years ago who the first time I taught him, I taught him in VBS, you know, in, in my home church. And so, so like I, I have that, I think I have that bent to where I, I enjoy kids and I enjoy teaching a younger generation. Um, and, um, in my first pastoral ministry role, I was an associate pastor at a small church here in Louisville. And as an associate pastor in a small church, you do lots of things. And so um, I got to teach on Wednesday nights and ha- help lead some Sunday school things, but also help um, with VBS each summer. And so yeah. when Megan and I came to Sojourn Church, where we are now, where I served on staff for 15 years, um, we um, um, I, I was asked to be on the Children's Committee because I had... Um, I had planned a VBS before and I'd worked on a church staff with some children's programming before. And so I was just asked to speak in to that on a, in a committee structure. Um, and Rob Plummer was who asked me. Um, okay. and so we, um, we were given, we were a church plant. We were, um, we purchased our first building and we're moving into the new building. So the committee had the responsibility to pick out all the furniture and those kinds of things. So I had come to two or three meetings in a row. And then I think it was the fourth or fifth meeting. Um, I was driving on the way to the meeting and my phone rang and um, it was Rob. And he said, hey, by the way, I'm not going to be there tonight. You're in charge. And um, and he never came back to another meeting. He just put me in charge and um, I was tricked. <laughs> and then maybe a, and then maybe a year later, I was on staff at the church leading children's ministry things. And, um, um, and it was at that point that we were kind of rethinking our, um, our, our next step toward training for Bible translation versus staying in the church and serving. And so the Lord redirected right in, right in that season in that way. So yeah, I was not looking for that role. I was just kind of voluntold. This is what I'm doing, you know? So, yeah. Yeah, well, definitely, definitely seems to be right in the way that you are bent for ministry. And, and I think I'm, I'm even um, just struck by the longevity that you continue to have in contributing to, in particular, that area of ministry, of course, many other areas now. But I think a lot of people, when they think of children's ministry, they often think, similar to the way that we might think about youth ministry, is it we think it really, what's most important is having a younger person who's leading, who brings energy, and that's very important. But sometimes it can be lost that there is a wisdom of longevity or a wisdom that's gained through over time that is so important, especially when we we start talking more about family ministry, because there's so many challenging mm-hmm. questions and and experiences and you know, trying to lead and grow healthy families. So I think it's really an impressive thing to have that you referred to yourself earlier as older. Uh, so having this time 
to gain experience and wisdom and then continue to be able to bring it in fresh ways as you're doing is just very impressive and uh and just a great just a great gift to churches you know and i think that's a i think that's a beautiful thing that's that's an awesome thing there were a thing. couple of there are a couple of men who really i mean i i'm not that much older i'm in my 40s now but yeah. um i Me too. you know um there were a couple of men who were older than me steps ahead of me that modeled that for me and i i think the model of those guys of this is something they're passionate about and something they care about investing in and um yeah i i found that to be inspiring and not as you know i, I don't have the maybe i have some insecurity but I, I don't think i think because i've seen them model such confidence in doing that through their life i don't have the the insecurity about i've got to get to something different and bigger and better like this is this is a really dignity filled valuable ministry for the local church in this episode with Jared Kennedy, you'll hear him talk about the impact of a book called Show Them Jesus by Jack Klumpenauer, teaching the gospel to kids. With a simple framework and real-life examples, Jack helps teachers identify and communicate the heart of the gospel to each child in each lesson. Show Them Jesus challenges the culture of low stakes, low expectations teaching, and invites teachers to do nothing less then teach and treasure the good news of Jesus in every lesson. Instead of leaving kids with lessons about merely changing their behavior, Show Them Jesus offers a new way by sweetly, masterfully, and powerfully showing kids how the gospel really applies to their lives and changes them for eternity. To learn more or get your copy of Show Them Jesus, visit newgrowthpress.com. So what do you find are maybe a couple, two or three of the really central issues that every family needs help with, uh, whether it's something small or whether it's something big, something obvious or something not so obvious? What are the big things that you find yourself talking about a lot or confronting and and ministering into? Um, man, that's a really big question. I think... Um... I, I think in terms of family ministry and local churches, I think having um, the kind of culture as a church that really gives a welcome, a gospel welcome to people is a, is a really important thing. And I, I think there's a, there's a ton of layers to that. You know, there's the, um, are we going to be safe and secure? Like, layer of that it it, it is is the church going to be trusted to keep my child safe you know that there's that layer of the child protection policies piece of that there's the the warm and friendly layer um i mean sam alberry likes to talk about um like when people come to church they show up with like lots of social anxiety uh a lot of times and 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 like it's the same way when they come over to your house and a good host will just put them at ease and like knows how to like make them feel like this is their home too and really kind of put them at ease so they're not on their toes. And I, I think that um, to have a children's ministry environment that's like that where there's warm people um, who who welcome um yeah, warm people who welcome maybe new families, but maybe that that mom who's just struggling to get to church that morning, or or that dad who's really anxious about this day. You know, I I think that um, that welcome is one of the, I think it's one of the really important things, um, and I think it's in those in that welcome, oftentimes that um, those those kind of third chair relationships, you know. You, mom and dad maybe are in chair number one and two mm -hmm. in a child's life. Maybe a minister is in child mm -hmm. chair three, but like um, some of the most like influential people in my life growing up are Miss Edwina who led our Bible drill class. And, you know, Mr. Mixon who taught uh, 
my seventh grade Sunday school class and we all passed the shoes underneath the table <laughs> and hit our shoes from each other. You know, like I, I just think, I think in the people who deal with childishness, with gentleness and firmness, but are love the word and teach the word, like, like those people have such a lasting influence on the next generation. And I think it's, it's having a culture of welcome where you can come in and be at home. I I've ministered my ministry career in the city. And so I think, mm. um, you know, in, in rural envir- environments, oftentimes there's more stability. Um, but, but in America these days, like everyone moves so much and is in new cities all the time. And I think it increases to some degree that anxiety that we feel in new places. And so a welcome, um, where where folks are put at ease and welcomed in gives the place for that relationships um, that have a lot of those relationships that have a lot of uh, kind of sticking power uh, for kids to stay with the church even beyond high school, knowing they have those other those other relationships in their life. So that's that's one. I think um, I think um, yeah, I think Christ centered teaching. Mm-hmm is one of, is one of really the most important things. And, um, Jack Klumpenhauer's book and Marty's like mentorship and friendship are two of the things that have really brought that home for me over the years. Um, the, um, you know, those asking those questions, Marty's question for me was uh, when you're teaching the Bible to kids, ask, ask who in this story needs the good news Mm. and help kids identify with that Mm. person in the story. Um, And I think that's, that's, that's something that's been really important for family devotions for our family. And I I think is really important for families and also just really important for, um, for kids in a local church ministry too. And so, you know, when numbers 21 says that the Israelites said there is no food and no water and we hate this miserable food. You realize, wait, you just said there's no food, but you hate this miserable food. And that it is exactly like the teenager standing at the refrigerator saying there's nothing to eat. I just had that conversation 30 (laughs) minutes ago. I just had that conversation 30 minutes ago. But there's meatloaf. Leftover from last night. I hate this miserable thing. You know, it's exactly that kind of thing. Provided um, manna and quail and water for you, yeah. but you don't want it. Um, and I, I think when we help kids see themselves in the grumbling Israelites in the story, um, it helps them identify more. Both that God's judgment, the judgment of His law, comes for them, and that the good news of the gospel, the good news of that bronze serpent, that. Moses lifted up that points us forward to Jesus. The good news is more real for them as well. I think I'm just, um, I'm just of the conviction. The great commission goes in two directions. It goes across geography and it goes Mm. from generation to generation. Yeah. And so seeing our own children in our homes and the children in our churches as a mission field. And I think, um, in Baptist life, we love missions and we want to go, um, we go on mission trips in the summer, we go overseas, but to really see that the Lord has called you to your family and that the great commission really does go from generation to generation. And so there's a great opportunity to, to go to your kids as a witness and um, to share your own testimony, to share your faith. And so those are the things for me that um, that gospel welcome, like solid gospel centered teaching and, and really believing that it's a mission um, are are the things that have been really important yeah. for me in, in thinking about family ministry. Yeah. We've thought about that a lot in our family recently with five kids and uh, just, you know, it's always been kind of on our minds and hearts, the challenge and responsibility of, of shepherding our own kids well i have you know we have not always done that uh well we've all we all have our shortcomings but yeah that's a that's a much needed a much needed truth what are some of the main tools that you have found most useful maybe even in your own family you know the the tools of family ministry at your house 
what are the tools? And, and, you know, a lot of parents don't know where to start. Um, we certainly were there. Sometimes we still feel like we're there, but what are some of the tools that you think that have really, uh, made up like the central arsenal for you in your home and caring for your kids and, and caring for them spiritually in a Christ centered way? Yeah, I, I think, um, I can think of specific tools, but I can also think of, of rhythms. Mm, um, mm-hmm. And I, I think the rhythms in some ways are um, are the things that are almost more lasting. And then the tools just come in to reinforce the rhythms, you know. And so, um, so you know, one of the rhythms has been just, just kind of thinking about that annual calendar. And so, you know, Megan and I are pretty type A planners and um, those linear thinkers I was talking about earlier. And, um, and so we, you know, we plan our vacations years in advance. We're thinking ahead of those kinds of things. But I, I think, um, you know, thinking about the season of, um, of Christmas and, and Easter and the days leading up to Easter as times with, that have been sort of like renewal seasons for, devotional rhythms for us and so right. if if i start out the school year strong and family devotions is starting to lack um when we get to advent when we get to thanksgiving um we have a we have a jesse tree i don't i don't know if you know what that is it's like a it's like a five dollar uh walgreens christmas tree and uh little little ornaments that um go with stories throughout the bible and we we just tell those 25 stories up to christmas with our kids and now now that they're teenagers like we just hand them the ornament and tell us tell them to tell us the story you know because yeah. this is just a tradition of putting this on the tree as we but that but that rhythm has been um yeah just a really formative thing i think i I discovered how formative it was for my kids. It was something we did, you know, and then, um, and then my oldest daughter had to do a report on a family tradition and everyone in her class talked about Santa, Santa Claus. And she, uh, one, um, one little girl who is Jewish talked about Hanukkah and she talked about her advent tree. And, um, and I, I realized I was like, Oh, this is, this is pretty distinctive for our family. This is something that she's going to remember that's really different later on. And so um, I, going to the Christmas, our Christmas Eve service at our church is at midnight on Christmas Eve night. And we sing in um, Christmas Day by singing Silent Night. And and so little traditions like that, that um, have been both corporate ones with our church family, but also with our family. Um, have been a big part of that rhythm. And then I, I would say the the daily rhythms of um, with our daughter who's autistic, um, I think, I I mean, I don't always know what discipleship looks like with mm. her. Like I, mm-hmm. I feel like at a loss a lot mm. of times. Um, but we, when I wake her up in the morning, I say, wake, sleeper, rise from the dead. <laughs> and she answers back and Christ will shine on you. And then rolls her eyes at me and pulls the covers back over her. <laughs> but she like knows that. Um, yeah, that's so sweet. She knows that's like how we start the day, you know, and, and she crosses off her schedule and crosses off her calendar. And then we'll say the Apostles Creed and the Lord's Prayer together at night before she goes to bed. Like she knows those lines um, she says Pontius Pilate really slow because she wants to pronounce it right. I'm not sure she knows what it's about, but she, you know, I, th- I think those kinds of little rhythms are just part of like the regular teaching of the, f- and I think the, and so Sabbath has been one for us. And I'm not a, I'm not a Sabbatarian that says you must keep the Lord's day. That's not, um, been part of my faith tradition and yet um there was a short season where where my daughter first started working at a local coffee shop and she was being scheduled some on sunday afternoon after church um and i was working in ministry and so was always kind of in and out on sundays um and one of the um one of the best things about the last couple of years is i've 
been in more of a regular day job working for TGC is that um, we reclaimed those Sunday afternoons and, um, and we just sit around the table together um, and, and, and that's the time we read through a devotional book. We just read through Kevin DeYoung's um, uh, the good news. We almost forgot his devotional on the Heidelberg catechism. Um, And, and, um, and then we, you know, I read through books of the Bible together, those kinds of things. And that, um, you know, I, I think we had a bedtime routine when kids were young, but as they've gotten older, having that weekly Sabbath routine where we're sitting down after church and, and studying together has been, um, you know, between marching band and, and cross country and, um, you know, therapy sessions for our, our daughter with a disability, like to have that, that place at the end of the week or beginning of the week that we're, we have put the stake down. This is our family time together and we're going to keep that rhythm has been a really helpful thing. Yeah. And then we just kind of in, interchanged all the, um, here's my free advertising, all the new growth press devotionals, like for Christmas and Easter. So yeah, Scott James little <laughs> devotional and Marty's devotionals. Like, I mean, we just over the years used those things to supplement our holidays and they become part of our annual rhythm. And it was so helpful for us to, um, to just incorporate that in what we did yeah. as a family. Watch out for a new resource coming in September of 2023 from Kevin Hippolyte, Trey Coleman, and Jared Kennedy called Faith Builder Catechism, Devotions to Level Up Your Family Discipleship. The most enthralling video games take place in elaborate kingdoms, don't they? With characters we root for and stories we connect with. When playing a video game, we learn to inhabit the game's world. The same is true with our faith. Whether you're taking your first steps in family discipleship or are a pro who has weekly devotional routines in place, the interactive questions, answers, and devotionals in Faith Builder Catechism will help your family establish building blocks of faith one level at a time. Authors Kevin Hippolyte, Jared Kennedy, and Trey Coleman lead the way for families to establish regular discipleship conversations and cultivate a deeper knowledge of the theology expressed in the Apostles' Creed, the Ten Commandments, the Doctrines of Grace, the Great Commission, and the Lord's Prayer. This resource includes fun stickers so kids can level up and track their progress at any stage. It's written by three dads raising kids in a digital world, experienced in children's and family ministry. And this book will help your family build a biblical worldview step by step by focusing on God's glory, God's kingdom, the gospel, God's church, and God's mission. You can learn more at newgrowthpress.com. So tell me about these chickens. Yes, Megan really wanted chickens. And um, and I fought against her and said, we live in the suburbs of a city in a subdivision. And, she, and like, there's no way we can have chickens. We will wake our neighbors. This is not Yeah, and it's pretty restrictive where we live. The rules or laws are pretty restrictive about pets we can only have we don't have any pets now we have a little bit in the past you can only have so many pets you know cumulative number of pets and then i think you can i think you can have chickens here you can't have any crowing animals yeah yeah any roosters so yeah i can't have a rooster i think so um she did the research and she's like this is totally legal you're not breaking the law we should get chickens and then um, we went on a walk on Memorial Day, and I seriously, honestly, the clouds opened up and the sun shone through, and this chicken walked out of one of our neighbor's yards and kind of like began to walk. And Megan like looked at me and it was, it was a like, sign. it was it was an absolute chicken sign. She just looked at me and she said, "Look, we should have chickens." And so, um, why have chickens been good for parenting? Uh, we have basically done chicken funerals. Like we have had chickens die from all kinds of predators. And so we have had to go around the dinner table and, and give our eulogies for chickens. So they've taught my kids about death. 
um, chickens will submit to you. Like they think that you're the rooster if you feed them. And so there's like certain ways you can teach them to like kind of squat down and submit to you when you're down. So they, they you know, you, our, kid, our daughters have learned lots about family dynamics with, with chickens. That's we did have really one fascinating. Rooster. We did have one rooster that we, um, was probably right waking our neighbors that we had to give away to a local farm. And so, um, and we have always, they are totally pets. They do give back, they lay eggs, but they're, they're totally pets. We've named them all. And so the first group was named after different flowers. And the second group was named after Harry Potter characters. Okay. And, um, um, the current group is all, um, well, we have Iris and Persephone and Athena. And so they're all Greek goddesses right now. <laughs> so, so every time, every time, we get a new batch of chickens um, and they'll last like four or five years. And, and then we start over with chicks. And so really it's, it's, it's been great. I, I didn't want to do it, but it's been a good thing. That's really fascinating. Truly, truly. You should fascinating. do it, Rush. You should I don't, do it, Rush. I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it, but I want to watch you do it. And I want, and then you can tell me all the lessons that you're learning from chickens. Maybe, maybe there's a children's book or something in there somewhere. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> may, yeah, for, maybe. Maybe. I do like that. I do like that idea. Okay, last last question, maybe. You've talked a lot about ministry in your family, ministry in your church, ministry through the Gospel Coalition. And I'm curious, is there something that you have on the top of your mind that God's teaching you? Is there something that you're, you really feel like God's, you know, cheerfully working on in you as a, as a person, aside from family, aside from TGC, writing, editing, what's going on for you? Yeah. I mean, I'm parenting teenagers and, um, and I think our oldest is going to college this year and, um, uh, she's going to go to university of Kentucky. So she's doing health sciences health sciences kind of things. And so she's, she'll be working. Uh, I grew up a big Kentucky fan. I was a big Kentucky fan. Yeah. Our youngest is a big Cardinals fan and she's very disappointed in her older sister. So there, there there's tension in the house a little bit, but um, no, I think, um, I think this is just true when you have teenage kids and um, you think that in the toddler years, all the like, kind of frustration and things are gone. And I think I see, um, um, I, I also, be, you know, it's a stressful thing to send off your first one to college, you know? And, and so, and I, I think I, I feel some of the anxiety over that. And, um, I, what the Lord is teaching me is to repent quickly mm. and, um, and to, uh, you know, really examine my words every day. Um, and one of our pastors, um, preached, uh, probably a year ago on preparing for communion by examining, uh, your heart each day of the week. And, um, and I think that, that stopping at the end of the day, thinking over the words I've spoken during the day, and then immediately obeying the Lord and repenting. Um, whether that's to my kids or to other people um, has been something that, um, you know, I believe all of life is repentance, but I, I think um, really practicing and living as if all of life is repentance is something the Lord um, uh, in his sweet mercy is teaching, teaching me to do. I'm grateful to have had this encouraging and joyful time with my friend, Jared Kennedy. This has been Straight to the Heart. Our next episode releases in one week on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. 